Hey guys, thanks for listening to this week's Campus Safety Voices podcast. I am Amy Rock, Campus Safety Senior Editor. For this episode, we'll be discussing a very important and pressing topic, which is student mental health. Last fall, three children's health groups declared a national state of emergency in child and adolescent mental health, and they cited the pandemic as a driving force behind the growing concerns. And now that most schools are back to in-person learning or at least some sort of hybrid model, I wanted to talk to mental health professionals who are working with K-12 students to kind of get a further grasp on this data and to see how or if the transition away from remote learning and back to in-person has made a difference. I spoke to Amy Grosso, who is the Director of Behavioral Health Services for the Round Rock Independent School District in Texas. And we talked about what she has seen happening with her students. And Round Rock ISD has 15 mental health professionals that are housed within the district's police department. And so they work alongside each other to address school safety concerns. And we spoke about how she has seen student mental health evolve over the past two years, programs the district has in place to address mental health challenges and how those programs have had to be altered to fit students evolving mental health needs and challenges. And also we talked about some of the challenges and barriers the district has come across while trying to transform those programs and also what students are seeking from the district to help them cope. We also talked about how smaller or more rural schools or districts that may have limited budgets can help students, how campus police, in addition to mental health counselors, can help students, and also about the current state of mental health for teachers, since that conversation often gets overlooked. Here's our talk. Be sure to subscribe to Campus Safety's YouTube channel and like or leave a comment on our videos or subscribe to our Campus Safety Voices podcast on Apple and Spotify and leave a review. So we can start by going over your background and your current role uh, with the Round Rock ISD. Uh, Absolutely. Um, I have a very wide variety of background (laughs) experiences coming into this, but my Masters and my PhD are in counseling and counselor education. So did that and became a mental health counselor for a hospital system in North Carolina for a number of years. And then slowly transitioned to education. My heart has always been with K-12 education and really looking for a way of how do I use my background in mental health and my passions in that regard within a job. And I I don't think I ever could dream up the position I have right now, but it's uh, totally a good fit for me. So I am the director of behavioral health services for Round Rock ISD, which is a school district um, outside of Austin, Texas. And we have about 48,000 students. So a pretty large district here in Texas. Um, And I'm housed within our police department, which is something way different than most school districts do. So I work alongside our police of chief, our chief of police and our officers, but I also oversee a team of social workers. Um, we started out with 10, I just hired more. So we're gonna be a department of 15 by the end of the month. And so our social workers work with our campuses, but they also work with our officers hand in hand so that we ensure that we're looking at the holistic needs of students and how do we assess what's really going on instead of just arresting and how can we make sure that our officers have that support so they don't feel like they have to be the expert on everything. Right, you guys must, 15 probably isn't even nearly enough to what you need, but that's great to be able to get that. Yeah, I got hired two years ago last week, and at that point I was a party of one, and so to see from that time to now be to 15 um, is extraordinary and I think really shows the district's commitment, but also the need we're seeing within um, schools. That's wild. So you started like two months before it hit the fan. <laughs> it was exactly two months before we, we shut down for COVID. Wow. Well, at least you got two months under your belt before everything changed completely. <laughs> That's Absolutely. insane. Speaking to mental health, I think a lot of people don't realize, they don't think of necessarily K through 12 kids as as ones struggling with their mental health it's more adults or you know young adults so can you just maybe speak to this a bit more and maybe the challenge uh the changes you've noticed in its prevalence as we've entered almost two years into this pandemic absolutely i think a lot of people when we think of mental health we only think of people with a mental health crisis and realizing that all of us just like we have physical health we have mental health and if we're not proactive about it that's when we can you know 
maybe miss some signs and symptoms that are coming up that we might need help. But it definitely, um, anybody at any time can have a struggle. Um, I think if I can say something positive that's come out of the pandemic, it's more of a focus on mental health, especially for our students in K-12. Um, but those of us who've been in the field for a, a long time know that this isn't a new reality. Uh, Pre-pandemic, the statistics were about one in four students would struggle with anxiety um, and about one in five with depression. And then we knew less than half of those would ever get the support they needed or actually get help for what they were struggling with. Um, suicide was and still is the second leading cause of death for 10, about 10 to 34 year olds. But if, even if you break it down um, just for our school age children, it's the second leading cause of death only behind accidents. And so I think we have to look at that first that it's not like mental health was wonderful for our students pre-pandemic. And then you do place the pandemic on it, which then I think exasperated a lot of things. It also shut things down. So were people not getting earlier intervention or care than maybe they had before? And then you do just have to look at what we've all been through. And some people have had a harder struggle or more difficulties during the pandemic than some didn't. And we all respond differently. So even if maybe it looked like on the outside, my life was great as a student, I, the isolation, the loneliness or anxiety from everything that was going on could have had a tremendous impact on me. And so I think we just, we were at a place of concern pre-pandemic and then I think it just exasperated it because of what's happened the last two years. It's interesting to see, it gives you a little hope in some ways for like the next generation, because I think of people my parents age and like no one talks about mental health and no one goes to a therapist. Now I, you see memes about like, oh, I told my therapist this today, like people speaking more openly about, you know, challenges that they're having with their mental health. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, 30 years from now, um, hopefully these conversations help catapult it into something that's talked about. Like if I were to break my leg and have to go to the hospital. No, absolutely. And I, even pre-pandemic, I would do some sessions for some high school classes just on mental health. And I would always come to like, what is the one thing we as adults can do to help? And they're like, just make my parents understand that this is real. That even pre-pandemic, this generation of students understood mental health. They weren't ashamed of it. They weren't afraid of it. But it was the adults that were struggling with understanding mental health. And I do think now because of what's happened the last two years that I think the adults are finally looking at it and we're not, we're not carrying the stigma as much as we maybe were before. And obviously people, it's not just mental health crises that's important. It's just, just anyone struggling with, you know, average mental health daily challenges. And obviously they all present themselves in different ways, depending on the person. And have you seen um, if these issues have been presenting themselves in a different way since the pandemic or maybe more noticeable than before? Yeah, and I, I like what you said that it, it runs a gamut of how people experience a mental health concern. And I think at schools, especially we're used to dealing with that crisis point, right? If a student's in crisis, we know what to do because we need to know what to do then. But we maybe not pay attention as much on the prevention part, ongoing support, post prevention kind of thing. And I sort of look at it that we have to be doing all of those. Um, I, I know at the beginning of the year here, we were seeing quite a bit of crisis, mental health crisis needs. And, you know, is that A, the pandemic, what we've been going through, but B, is it also that students weren't on campus for so long? So then they're back. So we're finally seeing, or are they getting the support that maybe they need that wasn't available when they were at home. Um, and so I think those are some, we're still seeing anxiety is still a high concern, you know, and I think as students have transitioned and adults back from, if they've been at home for a year or two and now they're transitioning, coming back to campus, that can produce a lot of anxiety also because I felt like I could be safe and control my environment when I'm home. And now I'm in a big building with lots of people around and that can increase my anxiety. Um, and so I don't know if I've seen it manifest as much differently as it's just been a lot more volume of what we've seen um, and students and parents wanting help for their child, which I think is a good thing too, but it's also, it's why we're seeing that there's not enough um, supports in communities. There's not enough hospital beds. And so we're really seeing that happen right now too. 
And I, this was a couple months ago. I'm trying to think of when it was. I think I want to say it was in October. I actually was registered for a webinar where you and Chief Yar, is it Yar Bro? Yar Bro, yeah. Yar Bro, okay. I always, I'm sure, not sure if it's Brow or if I'm putting an extra R in it. Anyway, so I sat through the webinar and it was interesting. We're talking about the four, I think it was the four pillars of campus policing. And um, so I could tell sitting on that, that you guys have pretty thorough, you know, mental health resources for students and have now having 15 counselors is amazing. Um, what are some su successful strategies or programs your school has implemented uh, to address mental health since the pandemic, you know, or have there been tweaks to the plans to, to handle these changes or the influx and concerns? Um, a, it was our, our staff has increased in size, <laughs> you know, seeing what we needed. We hired where well, we have 10 campus based social workers. We hired two that are purely going to help with crisis support um, and not just in the crisis situation, but as kids, if they are hospitalized, how do we transition them back to campus? Um, because that transition part is just as critical as the going part, I would even say is more critical of how they come back and how we support them once they're back. Um, we also have a staff social worker. So really, um, one social worker purely focused on just our staff needs because we didn't know that that's really um, important. You know, I think it's things we've been doing all along, but even amping it up more, like how do we provide really good education professional development for all staff across campus, campuses um, to pick up those signs and symptoms and how not to wait until it's a crisis to be able to reach out or speak up. Um, so we partnered with American Foundation for Suicide Prevention in their training talk saves lives. It's an introduction to suicide prevention. Um, we had all our counselors trained to be able to deliver that. So every staff member um, received that training um, from the beginning of the year through October. So I think it's some of those efforts of really um, intentional best practices. And so that's why partnering with a national organization um, and that we were able to do that for free um, for all of our staff. And you know, we realized too that staff were very grateful not just for seeing, getting the information for with students, but also for colleagues or their own personal life and realizing when we educate about mental health and suicide awareness, that we're helping our whole community, not just what within the school building. I feel like schools, it's like damned if you do, damned if you don't, like putting resources into, I talked to someone the other day who does uh, training for staff on uh, handling um, like de-escalating uh, crises, crises. <laughs> uh, and she was saying how so many schools are like, I don't know if it's state pressure or what it is, but trying to get kids like back on, like focusing on the curriculum and kind of not addressing, you know, these things that so many kids have gone through in the last two years. And it's, it's so hard for schools trying to balance, trying to get kids back on track academically, but then also trying to make sure that they're their mental health needs are being taken care of as well. It's just, I can't even imagine how hard it is to find a balance. What is and right, and what we want to do as a district or in a classroom, but then what are obligations from the state? Um, you know, all those different things that play into a school and that then our teachers and our counselors and our social workers and principals, like they're on the ground actually doing the work and seeing um, what's happened with our students and our families, you know, a lot of families economically the last two years have been devastating for them, which then impacts their mental health and their mental well-being. Um, a lot of our students and staff members have had deaths that have happened. So then you have this grieving process. And so it's a lot of things coming at once. I often say too that I think schools are task tasked with a lot of this because mental health in our society um, is really struggling too, like mental health care. There's not enough counselors. There's not enough psychiatrists. There's sure not enough child and adolescent psychiatrists and they weren't pre-pandemic. So there's not enough resources in the community. And so that then sort of gets placed on schools with even more limited resources. And so it's, um, of course, schools are doing it because we know that educators care about the students that walk through their doors and they're gonna do anything they can to help them. And um, back to that webinar that I sat in on, I remember, I'm trying to see if I can get the quote right, but he was saying, uh, Chief was saying, or it might have been you, was saying equality doesn't equal equity, or was it the other way around? It's basically like you want to get, like, basically every child has different things that they need, and they need equal access to something, but it might be different from one child to another, and I, I when I, I was taking notes during that, and I bolded that, and that was something that really stuck with me. 
Yeah, he always uses the example that one of our officers did in interviews. I'm, I said in all of our police interviews, um, it's part of our model that behavioral health is such a critical component, but that like equity is everybody getting a pair of shoes. Equality is everybody getting a pair of shoes that fit. And so realizing within mental health and behavioral health that what works for one child is gonna to be totally different that works for another. And realizing it's because their needs are different, their family systems are different, um, what, who they are are different. And so I think that that's an approach we look at um, holistically through our department of understanding what each child or staff member needs. I love analogies like that. They can seem so corny sometimes, but they really are something that does stick with you. And I think they can be an effective way to like hit home uh, important points to people. Yeah, because I could have a pair of shoes and they'd be way too big. So that doesn't work for me or way too small. Like, okay, you still gave me a pair of shoes, but Bill over there, his shoes actually fit. So he can run and do all of those things. And so, right. um, yeah, we all, oh. we, we had heard many of that analogies with equity and equality, but in the interview, when the officer said that, we're like, that was really good. We're gonna, we did yeah. hire an officer though. <laughs> So, so he knows we use it all the time. <laughs> and uh, I feel like we'll touch on some of these questions as we go along. So forgive me if, if we've, we've hit on them already, but uh, what are some of the biggest challenges or barriers you've seen from your school in addressing uh, student mental health needs since the pandemic? And how have you tried to work to overcome those? The biggest roadblock for mental health right now for students is enough resources there's not enough resources in the community. There's not enough funding for schools to provide it. There's just not enough resources. And I think we're also seeing in a pandemic now that the mental health providers and communities and all, they're overworked and they're burnout right now too. And so they're leaving the field. And so we just have this really big gap. Um, and so what do you do? You do whatever you can, right? You, you as a team, we could focus on that all day or we can focus on what we can do. Um, and so for us, that's putting some things within the schools. It's hiring social workers that can help connect families with resources. Um, it's training, right? It's training of how our staff and um, support our students every day, that they are that one caring adult that it might seem small, but it really can make a huge impact on a student's life. Um, and so I think those are the things is really, I do this with our team all the time. I do a lot of parent sessions of really focusing on what's in our control versus not what's not in our control. And I feel like that's been the biggest thing to keep us on track the last two years is there's so much we can't control right now. Like I can't control, there's not enough um, resources in the community. So how do we focus on what we can control? I know that's such a hard thing to do like just in your daily life. People struggle with that. Obviously I do as well. Think like last week, my son's, uh, classroom was shut down for an exposure and you know you get all worked up and stressed out and it's like but we're we're lucky that you know I work from home and we made it work but you know then you think of the people who if they don't go to work they don't get paid what how stressful that is so it's just it's so different for everyone it is. I, I tell yeah. people to do this. I do it all the time. I draw a circle and really write in what's in my control inside of the circle and ask myself, am I focusing on that? Or am I focusing on all the things that I can't control? Yeah. When I was uh, researching questions that I, I thought um, that I would want to ask, I came upon this article that said, um, when there's population-wide trauma, uh, whether it's like this pandemic or, I mean, I remember 9-11, it's just like had a ripple effect, whether you were connected to someone in it or not, um, that we heal socially is what the article is saying, uh, you know, as in being together. And have you found since the pandemic and now that schools are back to in-person, have you seen that having like a great benefit on student mental health? I think being together always has a great impact on, on mental health in general. Um, you know, I know as an adult and I know how to practice and how to do certain things to help cope, but being locked down was hard for me. And I'm an introvert, <laughs> but that collective, that, like you're saying, and I think it's more than just through screens and stuff, it really is being with each other it does have a healing effect. And does I, do I think it heals everything? No, I think there's many things that are divisive right now in our society that um, we can't ignore that that impacts our students' mental health just as much as anything. Um, but I do believe us being together um, and kids be, getting to be kids 
Um, I have an eight year old and, you know, he, he's just excited to be back at school, to be playing on the playground um, and being with his friends. I think sometimes we forget that kids have been, sometimes are a little more adaptable than us as adults. <laughs> and so, I, know, I think I feel like people always worry about kids, which understandably so, but as an adult, it's, you need just as much help in a lot of ways <laughs> and being around, I, um, where I'm in Massachusetts, so it's winter and freezing here. And it, over the summer, you know, when COVID wasn't as bad as it is now, it's like we were seeing friends and doing a lot more things outside and everything. And now that winter's here, you just like realize how important those couple months were having that time with friends. And right now I can't wait for winter to be over. <laughs> well, I often say, you know, I think we, we focus so much because there is a mental, like mental health for students is a problem, but it's also a problem for us adults. Right. And a lot of times if a, a kid's struggling too, or are they learning things from me as the parent? Am I, am I highly anxious about things? And then my child is learning to be highly anxious about things. And, you know, and it, it can happen, even if I'm the best parent in the world, my child can struggle with mental health and it doesn't mean uh, I've done anything wrong. But I think sometimes as adults, we have to say, wait a second, what are we doing that's increasing this or decreasing it? There's a quote, and I don't remember who it was from, Years ago, um, it was a social worker talking about, we keep talking about this culture is impacting students' mental health, and we have to realize that we're the culture. That's a hard pill to swallow. <laughs> it <is. laughs> but it's so true, right? Like, so, so true. I know. I find myself as, as a parent, I have two kids. My son is three and my daughter is nine months. And you just try and you want to do things that like, I mean, I have, thankfully I have great parents, but everyone makes mistakes and you want to try to actively, you know, avoid those things that either as a kid, you remember that you didn't like, and it's just, your wheels are constantly turning and trying to like, make sure that your behavior is reflecting okay. And that their, their little brains are absorbing so much. And that's terrifying. <laughs> they do. Right. And like, yeah. how do I, what I do at home? Like if I'm, Am I being positive? You know, am I looking for what's in my control? Am I looking at the good things that are happening? Um, because that does impact our students. Yeah, absolutely. And I know you said a, a lot of there's a lot of students they they want help in helping their parents understand. Uh, so that might be one of these. But what's the biggest thing you're finding students uh, with mental health concerns are seeking from your district, and how are you providing that? I think it's just support, you know, it's, it's, it's help and it's the resources, it's guidance. It's, I feel like sometimes we, we forget that students, even high school students, they are still kids and they do want that guidance and support. And as much as we're struggling with what's going on and not knowing what's happening tomorrow, that they are struggling in the same way too. And so how, how are we understanding of that? Um, I think sometimes since the pandemic happened, a lot of times we can get into this, like who has it worse off? Like, is it the parents? Is it the teachers? Is it the student? Like, and sometimes do we miss the students in that? And that it's not a contest of who's had it worse. It's a contest of how do we come together and support each other? Mm -hmm. And obviously it's mental health is a concern for teachers as well. They're spread thin. And uh, how are you seeing teacher and staff mental health affected by the pandemic? I think they're tired. <laughs> you know, if we think about it, when this very first happened and everything closed down and everybody was home with their kids schooling, you know, there was this great rise of like, teachers are amazing. They do all these things. And then it's, it's sort of changed. And I don't see that they're getting that support that they need. Um, and then they're asking to continue to do really hard things all the time. Um, and so how do we find that support for them and appreciation and in the midst, even when things are hard for us. So as how do we support them? And so, cause they are spread thin, you know, and that's why we have started and we hired one position, which, um, as a staff social worker, so how do they really focus on our staff's well being and provide them resources and connect them with things in the community, um, knowing that this has been just as hard on them as anybody else. Yeah, I think when people were home with their kids, it's like you said, they had such an appreciation for teachers. And then you go, life goes back to somewhat normal. And then you kind of, everyone has so much going on in their own lives that 
as appreciative as they were of teachers, like everything else just gets in the way and then you kind of lose that. Um, so I, I mean, I have plenty of teachers in my family and I don't know how any of them do it. It's just like such important work, but so underappreciated and. It's so underappreciated and they just, they want to help kids, right? Like they do it because they love it. And so how do we help them with that? Um, how do we focus on the good things that are happening instead of the few small things that maybe didn't go exactly as planned? And I think what you said too, like the normal, I think as adults, we want everything to be back to normal and it's not. And so I think there's this lack of accepting that it's not normal right now. Is it, it probably never is gonna go back to how it was before. And the more we fight it, the more it's gonna be hard on everyone. Yeah, and that comparison to people being so you know, teachers are amazing. They do it all to not as much support is so it's like reflective also of nurses at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, people in New York city banging pans and stuff and supporting people at shift change. And then it's like something changed. Maybe it is anger that things aren't back how they should have been. Obviously there's a lot of factors in it, but nurses are facing that too. Not as much support as they were getting before. Not at all. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and now I'm sure even before the pandemic, you were talking about the importance of training and I'm sure that your programs have training for teachers for mental health and has the district intimate implemented, excuse me, programs for staff to recognize trauma or mental health struggles among students. Absolutely. I can mention the talk saves lives through American foundation for suicide prevention. Um, a lot of our, um, we have social workers trained to provide youth mental for mental health, first aid youth. It's a little longer training, but it's probably the best. It's such an amazing training for staff to understand. So some of our campuses choose that. And then about trauma, a lot of our campus, it's campus specific of what they want to implement, but trauma has been such a high priority of recognizing trauma. Um, how do you support that within a classroom? What do you do? Um, definitely as a district, really focusing in on that. And I will say as a district, we did a good job pre-pandemic. Of starting that work. And so I think it's just been a continuation and realizing we're seeing it on a larger scale. Yeah, I think there are a lot more free resources out there than, than people realize. Oh, there's so many great. So I've mentioned, so AFSP.org, um, there's a whole section on education. So they have sample policies, toolkits, and then NAMI, Internet, um, NAMI National Association of Mental Illness. So it's NAMI.org. Um, they're all across the United States, just like AFSP, tons of free resources um, for school districts. Um, you know, we're a district of 48,000 students, so we're fortunate to even have a whole behavioral health services department. Um, I grew up in a town with 1,200 people, um, so I graduated with 32 <laughs> from the public high school, and so I know our rural communities really struggle at times of how do they have resources and realizing that there's organizations like NAMI and AFSP out there that you can access training, you can access materials, support, your mental health authority always has trainings and supports. And so realizing that even if they're physically not close to you, um, thanks since we're really great at virtual now, <laughs> there, there's a lot of resources for our rural um, communities and school districts so they don't have to feel like they need to be an expert on mental health. Now, 1,200 people, is, was it a town in Texas? <laughs> was, Sundown, Texas. Okay, I don't picture small. When you think of Texas, you don't picture small, so. <laughs> oh, there's lots of tiny little towns It's out by Lubbock, so. Sundown, I love that name. <laughs> <laughs> so I went from that to a district with 48,000 students, so it's, um, you know, what? even, like, that's just, it's a different world from when I grew up, and so I think sometimes oh. we expect things to be, like, how we were when we grew up. And I think we're seeing that even with the pandemic changing things, we think it should be like it was pre-pandemic and realizing it's going to look different. And back to analogies, people always talk about putting masks on, your mask on before you help someone else. Um, and how it's like, when I say masks out loud, now I automatically think of regular masks, not the airplane ones, but, um, and back to teachers, how did, how has your district helped teachers and staff uh, handle their own mental health concerns. Yeah, and I think, you know, and I, this is such a hard one because it was even hard before of, you know, we would label it self-care or stuff for staff. So how do they do it? We do have a robust EAP program and employee assistance program. So really helping them know those 
staff members who need extra support, what does that look like? Um, I also know that a lot of our principals from our team have requested some sessions on self-care or how do our staff members take care of themselves. And I'm always quickly that that doesn't mean going to get a pedicure or <laughs> that's, you know, that doesn't really help what's going on. And so how do we help staff member have good boundaries? When you go home, how do you go home and be able to stop working so you can be with your family, finding the things that give us energy um, and being able to do those. And so I think that those for me too, that a lot of our principals have asked us to be able to come and talk to staff about a different approach to self-care than just quick little fixes. I, I think back to when I was growing up and I said my mom's a teacher and bringing home lesson plans till working on them till 10 o'clock at night. It's, it's not, it's like, I, I don't do that with my job. And so I don't know how teachers do it. It makes me, I, my sister-in-law is a teacher at the high school in our town and they have a, a lot of professional development days, like on the calendar that I know when I was in school, like wasn't a thing. And, you know, people roll their eyes at, Oh, another half day or, but it's like, that's a great way to also help teachers with their mental health because they're working on some things, you know, during the school day. And then that frees up some time for them. Um, I mean, most of them still go home and are doing lesson planning anyways, but I think I just, that was a comparison that I was thinking about in my head, how I, it's gotta be helpful a little bit at least. You know, and it's, it's even thinking of email, right? When I was a kid, there was no email. So you didn't email your teacher. Your parents weren't emailing your teacher at all ends of the night asking for information. And so is it one of those things too, like as parents, are we putting so much more on teachers just because we can, because email's there? Yeah. Yeah. I can't tell you how many texts my mom gets from, from parents. And especially now in the last two years, it's obviously been more than usual because parents are just trying to work through it as well. And they don't know what's the right or wrong thing to do when they're wanting reassurance from the teacher. But it's just when I can't believe how much my mom, you know, speaks to parents on text or like a class dojo app thing. It's just, it's just never stopping. And it's hard to take that time for yourself. And my thing is too, for parents, like if you're always contacting them, are they ever just for good things? I even catch myself, like, I I don't want to send the email to my son's teacher because, oh my gosh, she probably has 20 million, but I just want to tell her, thank you that she's doing a good job and realizing that we need to send those even more to our staff at school. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think your district is in a unique position in that you have, you know, now 15 specialists that you work directly, that work with campus police. And for schools where that structure isn't possible, or, you know, at least it isn't anytime soon, what are some ways that they can ensure campus police are in a position to support students who may be having um, mental health issues or crises? I think it, it's two things. Like if it is an SRO program that the district has of what kind of training are they getting outside of the the standard law enforcement training. You know, our officers get a variety of different trainings um, with social workers and stuff. You can still do that even if you're not in the same department. And, you know, we have a lot of officers that are mental health officers, but then when they did mental health first aid youth, they realized that they had never been trained on mental health within youth and how it looks different in adolescents. So I think really looking at what training is available to the officers, but I also think just being intentional about communication with each other. Like, do you sit down and realize how the officer can be of a support, but then how the counselors or social workers, whatever those mental health people that you have on your campus and so that you're on the same team. Um, I think this analogy works, even if you're not in the same department is we always talk about, we have to stay in our lane, right? Like our lane is very different than the police's lane. Now, sometimes we have to swerve a little bit, (laughs) you know, back and forth, but I think just having those dialogues and conversations and everybody realizing we each have our special skill set and it doesn't make us better or worse than the other person. It just means it takes all of us to truly help students. It's just like a never ending, never ending work. Yeah. And never ending <laughs> conversations, right? Because yeah. I mean, we're in partway through year two for us of this model and it's, we're still discovering new things or how do we need to change things and realizing that you put things in place and then you're going to have to change them and keep refining them and best practices like research comes out that dictates new changes and so never feeling like you've ever arrived. I guess what hopefully knock on wood one of the best like good things to come out of this pandemic it's like 
this is so insane and unprecedented and we're having to move things around to make things work. And so I hopefully, you know, down the road, it makes schools more prepared for minor inconveniences and they have, you know, infrastructure in place to address that. And hopefully it's not another, you know, it'll be another hundred years before before another one of these. <laughs> I did want to say one last thing that came to my mind for school districts that doing something's better than nothing. Mm -hmm. So you might not be to where we are, right? And it doesn't matter, but any kind, just implementing one new training, implementing just talking about mental health will make a difference.